Chapter Three of Roughing It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter Three. About an hour and a half before daylight, we were bowling along smoothly over the road, so smoothly that our cradle only rocked in a gentle, lulling way that was gradually soothing us to sleep and dulling our consciousness, when something gave away under us. We were dimly aware of it, but indifferent to it. The coach stopped. We heard the driver and conductor talking together outside, and rummaging for a lantern, and swearing because they could not find it. But we had no interest in whatever had happened, and it only added to our comfort to think of those people out there at work in the murky night, and we snug in our nest with the curtains drawn. But presently by the sounds there seemed to be an examination going on, and then the driver's voice said, "'By George, the thoroughbrace is broke!' This startled me broad awake, as an undefined sense of calamity is always apt to do. I said to myself, Now a thoroughbrace is probably part of a horse, and doubtless a vital part, too, from the dismay in the driver's voice. Leg, maybe. And yet, how could he break his leg waltzing along such a road as this? No, it can't be his leg. That is impossible, unless he was reaching for the driver. Now, what can be the thoroughbrace of a horse, I wonder? Well, whatever comes, I shall not air my ignorance in this crowd, anyway. Just then, the conductor's face appeared at a lifted curtain, and his lantern glared in on us and our wall of mail matter. He said, Gents, you'll have to turn out a spell. Thoroughbrace is broke. We climbed out into a chill drizzle, and felt ever so homeless and dreary. When I found that the thing they called a thoroughbrace was the massive combination of belts and springs which the coach rocks itself in, I said to the driver, I never saw a thoroughbrace used like that before that I can remember. How did it happen? Why, it happened by trying to make one coach carry three days' mail. That's how it happened, said he. And right here is the very direction which is wrote on all the newspaper bags which was to be put out for the engines for to keep em quiet. It's most uncommon lucky, cause it's so nation dark I should have gone by unbeknownst if that air thoroughbrace hadn't broke. I knew that he was in labor with another of those winks of his, though I could not see his face, because he was bent down at work, and wishing him a safe delivery I turned to and helped the rest get out the mail sacks. It made a great pyramid by the roadside when it was all out. When they had mended the thoroughbrace, we filled the two boots again, but put no mail on top, and only half as much inside as there was before. The conductor bent all the seat backs down, and then filled the coach just half full of mail bags from end to end. We objected loudly to this, for it left us no seats. But the conductor was wiser than we, and said a bed was better than seats, and moreover, this plan would protect his thoroughbraces. We never wanted any seats after that. The lazy bed was infinitely preferable. I had many an exciting day subsequently lying on it, reading the statutes and the dictionary, and wondering how the characters would turn out. The conductor said he would send back a guard from the next station to take charge of the abandoned mail bags, and we drove on. It was now just dawn, and as we stretched our cramped legs full length on the mail sacks, and gazed out through the window across the wide wastes of greensward clad in cool, powdery mist, to where there was an expectant look in the eastern horizon, our perfect enjoyment took the form of a tranquil and contented ecstasy. The stage whirled along at a spanking gait, the breeze flapping curtains and suspended coats in the most exhilarating way. The cradle swayed and swung luxuriously. The pattering of the horse's hoofs, the cracking of the driver's whip, and his hi glang were music. The spinning ground and the waltzing trees appeared to give us a mute hurrah as we went by, and then slack up and look after us with interest, or envy, or something. And as we lay and smoked the pipe of peace, and compared all this luxury with the years of tiresome city life that had gone before it, we felt there was only one complete and satisfying happiness in the world, and we had found it. 
After breakfast, at some station whose name I have forgotten, we three climbed up on the seat behind the driver and let the conductor have our bed for a nap. And by and by, when the sun made me drowsy, I lay down on my face on top of the coach, grasping the slender iron railing, and slept for an hour or more. That will give one an appreciable idea of those matchless roads. Instinct will make a sleeping man grip a fast hold of the railing when the stage jolts, but when it only swings and sways, no grip is necessary. Overland drivers and conductors used to sit in their places and sleep thirty or forty minutes at a time on good roads, while spinning along at the rate of eight or ten miles an hour. I saw them do it often. There was no danger about it. A sleeping man will seize the irons in time when the coach jolts. These men were hard-worked, and it was not possible for them to stay awake all the time. By and by we passed through Marysville, and over the Big Blue, and Little Sandy, thence about a mile, and entered Nebraska. About a mile further on we came to the Big Sandy, one hundred and eighty miles from St. Joseph. As the sun was going down, we saw the first specimen of an animal known familiarly over two thousand miles of mountain and desert, from Kansas clear to the Pacific Ocean, as the jackass rabbit. He is well named. He is just like any other rabbit, except that he is from one-third to twice as large, has longer legs in proportion to his size, and has the most preposterous ears that ever were mounted on any creature but a jackass. When he is sitting quiet, thinking about his sins, or is absent-minded or unapprehensive of danger, his majestic ears project above him conspicuously, but the breaking of a twig will scare him nearly to death, and then he tilts his ears back gently and starts for home. All you can see then, for the next minute, is his long gray form stretched out straight and streaking it through the low sagebrush, head erect, eyes right, and ears just canted a little to the rear but showing you where the animal is all the time, the same as if he carried a jib. Now and then he makes a marvelous spring with his long legs high over the stunted sagebrush, and scores a leap that would make a horse envious. Presently he comes down to a long graceful lope, and shortly he mysteriously disappears. He has crouched behind a sagebrush, and will sit there and listen and tremble until you get within six feet of him, when he will get under way again. But one must shoot at this creature once, if he wishes to see him throw his heart into his heels, and do the best he knows how. He is frightened clear through now, and he lays his long ears down on his back, straightens himself out like a yardstick every spring he makes, and scatters miles behind him with an easy indifference that is enchanting. Our party made this specimen hump himself, as the conductor said. The secretary started him with a shot from the colt. I commenced spitting at him with my weapon, and all in the same instant the old Allen's whole broadside let go with a rattling crash, and it is not putting it too strong to say that the rabbit was frantic. He dropped his ears, set up his tail, and left for San Francisco at a speed which can only be described as a flash and a vanish. Long after he was out of sight we could hear him whiz. I do not remember where we first came across sagebrush but as I have been speaking of it, I may as well describe it. This is easily done, for if the reader can imagine a gnarled and venerable live oak tree reduced to a little shrub two feet high, with its rough bark, its foliage, its twisted boughs, all complete, he can picture the sagebrush exactly. Often, on lazy afternoons in the mountains, I have lain on the ground with my face under a sagebrush, and entertained myself with fancying that the gnats among its foliage were Lilliputian birds, and that the ants marching and countermarching about its base were Lilliputian flocks and herds, and myself some vast loafer from Brobdignag waiting to catch a little citizen and eat him. It is an imposing monarch of the forest in exquisite miniature, is the sagebrush, its foliage is a grayish green and gives that tint to desert and mountain. It smells like our domestic sage, and sage tea made from it tastes like the sage tea which all boys are so well acquainted with. The sagebrush is a singularly hardy plant and grows right in the midst of deep sand and among barren rocks where nothing else in the vegetable world would try to grow except bunch grass, 
Bunch grass grows on the bleak mountain sides of Nevada and neighboring territories and offers excellent feed for stock even the, in the dead of winter, wherever the snow is blown aside and exposes it. Notwithstanding its unpromising home, bunch grass is a better and more nutritious diet for cattle and horses than almost any other hay or grass that is known, so stockmen say. The sage bushes grow from three to six or seven feet apart all over the mountains and deserts of the far west, clear to the borders of California. There is not a tree of any kind in the deserts for hundreds of miles. There is no vegetation at all in a regular desert, except the sagebrush and its cousin the greasewood, which is so much like the sagebrush that the difference amounts to little. Campfires and hot suppers in the deserts would be impossible but for the friendly sagebrush. Its trunk is as large as a boy's wrist, and from that up to a man's arm, and its crooked branches are half as large as its trunk, all good, sound, hard wood, very like oak. When a party camps, the first thing to be done is to cut sagebrush, and in a few minutes there is an opulent pile of it ready for use. A hole a foot wide, two feet deep, and two feet long is dug, and sagebrush chopped up and burned in it till it is full to the brim with glowing coals. Then the cooking begins, and there is no smoke, and consequently no swearing. Such a fire will keep all night, with very little replenishing and it makes a very sociable campfire, and one around which the most impossible reminiscences sound plausible, instructive, and profoundly entertaining. Sagebrush is very fair fuel, but as a vegetable it is a distinguished failure. Nothing can abide the taste of it but the jackass and his illegitimate child, the mule. But their testimony to its nutritiousness is worth nothing, for they will eat pine knots, or anthracite coal, or brass filings, or lead pipe, or old bottles, or anything that comes handy, and then go off looking as grateful as if they had oysters for dinner. Mules and donkeys and camels have appetites that anything will relieve temporarily, but nothing satisfy. In Syria once, at the headwaters of the Jordan, a camel took charge of my overcoat while the tents were being pitched, and examined it with a critical eye all over, with as much interest as if he had an idea of getting one made like it, and then, after he'd done figuring on it as an article of apparel, he began to contemplate it as an article of diet. He put his foot on it, and lifted one of the sleeves out with his teeth, and chewed and chewed at it, and gradually taking it in, and all the while opening and closing his eyes in a kind of religious ecstasy, as if he had never tasted anything as good as an overcoat before in his life. Then he smacked his lips once or twice and reached after the other sleeve. Next he tried the velvet collar and smiled a smile of such contentment that it was plain to see that he regarded that as the daintiest thing about an overcoat. The tails went next, along with some percussion caps and cough candy and some fig paste from Constantinople. And then my newspaper correspondence dropped out, and he took a chance in that manuscript letters written for the home papers. But he was treading on dangerous ground now. He began to come across solid wisdom in those documents that was rather weighty on his stomach. And occasionally he would take a joke that would shake him up till it loosened his teeth. It was getting to be perilous times with him, but he held his grip with good courage, and hopefully till at last he began to stumble on statements that not even a camel could swallow with impunity. He began to gag and gasp, and his eyes to stand out, and his forelegs to spread, and in about a quarter of a minute he fell over as stiff as a carpenter's workbench, and died a death of indescribable agony. I went and pulled the manuscript out of his mouth, and found that the sensitive creature had choked to death on one of the mildest and gentlest statements of fact that I ever laid before a trusting public. I was about to say, when diverted from my subject, that occasionally one finds sage bushes five or six feet high, and with a spread of branch and foliage in proportion, but two or two and a half feet is the usual height. End of chapter three.